find a Bible if you would. I told you last week that we'd be in uh, Psalms. That's what we're going to look at this morning. Psalm 86. I told you that Psalms, they, they have a purpose. Uh, this morning in Sunday school, we talked about creation, because we ended up being outside, and, and, it, and it brought me back to the, to the knowledge of creation and why that's important everything else. And this psalm, it's going to talk about tons of things today. And so I know it's hot, I know it's a little bit uncomfortable, a little bit different, but I'd ask you to pay attention a little bit uh, more. It's probably, I probably, mean, you can probably clock me, it's going to be 20 minutes, maybe 25 for lucky. Uh, be pretty fast, all right? But we're going to be in the same spot, not going to be bouncing around a bunch of places. Uh, but let's just do it, right? Let's get God's word together, and uh, let's just see what it says. Okay. Psalm. Where was that? Eighty-six. Bow down thine ear, O Lord. Hear me, for I am poor and needy. Preserve my soul, for I am holy. O thou, my God, thank you. Uh, o thou my God, save thy servant that trusted in me. Be merciful unto me, O Lord, for I cry unto thee daily. Rejoice the soul of thy servant, for unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. For thou, O Lord, uh, for thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive, plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon thee. Give ear, O Lord, unto my prayer. Attend to the voice of my supplications. In the day of trouble I will call upon thee, for thou wilt answer me. Among the gods there is no other like thee, O Lord, neither are there any works like unto thy works. Any of you parents, do you ever like your kids telling you something? Some of you laugh, some of you chuckle. I mean, do your, your, your kids or your grandkids, or maybe even if you, if you know this, if not, I'm going to tell you how it is kind of a thing. That doesn't really work uh, with parents and kids. Uh, number one, it just kind of trumps mom's and dad's authority and it kind of says I know what I'm doing and I'm better than you and I'm smarter than you, right? It doesn't ever go over very well, right? Typically we've got to wait to adulthood or until they're older and then they kind of get some sense and they know how to say things uh, with all their teeth intact and then you tell them, you know, they, they can ask you for something or they can ask or as they get older, maybe older teenagers, they can ask, right? If you're not careful when you read this psalm, it almost sounds like David is telling God how it is. Um, that is not that is not what we're seeing. So we got to work at it, and we got to figure out what is what act, what is actually going on. Because we know, uh, even with own kids that you have, my iPad died for the heat. So we do all this from memory. Anyway, um, asking versus telling. If you if you, it doesn't work with kids. It's not going to work with God. And so David says, "Vow." But he's not, he's not telling God to come, come down here. But he's, he's asking God to be close to him. Do you see the difference? There's, there's a difference in asking versus telling. He's asking God. He's saying, God, please be close right now. Versus telling God to be here right now. Have you had those moments with God where you're like, God, where are you? But that's not what's going on here. He's asking and pleading God for God to be with him and hear him and listen to him. For I am poor and preserve my soul. Thou, my God, save my servant that trusts in thee. Save, preserve. Uh, those words aren't just brand new words. Those are the kind of words that, that come from someone who's in a relationship. Someone who knows God. Not something that's just kind of that, that's not your first thing whenever you just meet somebody for the first time, right? Uh, there's an intimate relationship between David and God that we have to look at today in the psalm and see what's going on. This psalm is a prayer. Uh, different songs. Some, sometimes their song, this was their songbook back in the day, just like you have. They would sing them, right? Um, this is a prayer. And if, and if you and I can just look at this and see, and, see and, and, and kind of see what this means, it can affect your prayer life the same way. Okay. Mercy. Merciful unto me, O Lord, for I cry unto thee daily. If you're a saved child of God today, if you know Jesus, uh, or a believer, or 
Christian or, or whatever label we put on that, because we know Christ, you have been given mercy. Vast mercy. Big time mercy. Uh, we don't deserve at all God's mercy. Right? The same God that created everything we talked about this morning, who keeps everything together, the one who's, who's a little angry, who we need to be fearful of, the fear of. That same God was merciful to me, right? And he sent his son to me. So mercy is something that I don't ever need to lose track of. But if you're not careful like me, uh, you'll go through Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and mercy has nowhere checked in from Monday anymore to Friday than ever before. And it ought to be an everyday, multiple times a day thing saying, you know, why am I judging this person whenever God's already forgiven me it's so merciful to me. Why am I being this way? It's so angry or it's so rude or whatever, whatever thing's going on when I've been given so much. I'm talking about asking, when is the last time that you can remember asking God to teach you something? to show you something, to teach you more about His grace, to, to actually teach you about Him. Uh, we're really good about asking God about the refrigerator when it goes out, uh, about the air conditioning problem, or the electricity bill problem, and things. God is funny. I, I, I didn't do that. The sermon was this morning, and then all this happened, right? Electricity goes out, well, then we're like, oh, Lord, going on, what's going on with electricity? I mean, that's where we live. That's where we operate. When, when, the, when the car breaks, or when the... Uh, the job goes crazy, right? Relationships get strained. Then we're just right there with God and we're just trying to, you know. But when have we asked God to teach me about your mercy? God, teach me about your, your loving kindness and all these other things that we're going to see later on in the song uh, that he's going to show us, right? Verse 5 and 6, For thou, Lord, art good, and ready to forgive, plenteous in mercy, unto all them that call upon thee. And so it's it, there's a principle of surrender that's all through the Bible, and it's going to be in here in Psalms, in the New Testament, it's all over the place, that that God is never, ever, ever, ever going to change how He is for us. Ever. He is me. I am the Lord. I change not. You know that from the Old Testament. God is central. God is who He is. He's not going to change His person. God is going to expect us to come to Him with what our needs and what our desires are. He's going to, he's going to expect us to, to come to Him for forgiveness. God isn't going to come, going to just change His mind and come try and, try and do multiple different things to, to get us to convince it to be different. Make sense? It's in the same verse here. Ready. Ready to forgive. Right? Plenty of sin mercy, meaning there's plenty of it. To all of them that call on me to call on you. Right? We don't need to call on God just one time whenever we get saved. Uh, if you haven't called on God uh, for forgiveness in a really long time, for some mercy, uh, it's time to check in. Because you're a little dry. Your tank is running on empty, and it's time to have that fixed. Right? Mercy, ready to forgive. That's him. Well, you'll run across the verse in the Bible and you'll look at it and you'll go, why is that there? That doesn't make sense. You know, it'll kind of throw you off for a loop. And if you're not careful, you kind of just glaze over it and you'll just be like, whatever. I don't really want to do that. It's among the gods, little G. And so what is the Bible saying? Is the, is the Bible saying that there's multiple gods in the world? The scripture teaches us that there is one, right? One true God, big G, G-O-D. Among the gods, there is none like unto you. O Lord, big letters. Jehovah, Yahweh. Neither are there any works like unto your works. 
little g in your Bible is always something man-made or something made up. I can create a religion and I can have all these rules and regulations and I can make it look good, I can make it sound good, I can have, have it well financed and have all the money in the world and it has no power whatsoever. It's all works-based. It's all based on doing something. God, whenever he does something, is, is miraculous. It's unexplainable. Um, the day of Pentecost, right? The Holy Spirit coming down. Jesus coming from the grave. That's unexplainable. All these things verify who God is, right? It's not some story that you're trying to get someone to believe that never happened, right? So there's the difference. None, neither are there any, any works like the Jew, but your works. There's none like the Jew. It's always going to be unpopular to be sitting at the table with everybody who kind of just does their own thing or they have their own beliefs and for you to say, well, I believe that there's one God. And that that one God says that the world... There's sin in the world, and that Jesus has to come to pay for sin. Uh, that's what I believe. And then it'll be like, well, you can believe what you want to believe, and I, I, I can believe that I'm going to be okay. No. The truth that I believe is exclusive. Feathers get ruffled, the, the demeanor changes. What do you mean? Meaning that there can be no other truth. That's what it is. Any other system is man made, it's false. Send the people down a path to one place, to one place only. And that's it. Not popular. Never has been popular, never going to be popular, right? But I can't change this. Just like God is not going to change himself for me, I cannot change what this is and vice versa. All nations who now has made, don't miss that. It doesn't matter if someone wants to believe in creation, that's fine. The, the point is that God still made it. God still made them. God still made the nations. God still made the world. If they don't want to believe it, okay, fine. However, that thou hast made, it keeps right on. You see how the Bible does that? The Bible doesn't care about opinion or anything like that. It just keeps right on going over it that thou hast made, and it just keeps, it keeps right on going. If, if we can get this in our brains, in our living, in our everyday life, it'll, it'll change how we are. It'll change the way people view us, right? I don't want people to hate me, but I want people to know, know who I am and know what I believe and know what I believe. That thou hast made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. You know that verse from the New Testament? Uh, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, right? Only difference is some are going to be saved that know him, and those that don't, well, they're going to go to another place. But everybody's going to know Verse 10, everybody read this one with me. For thou art great and dost wondrous things, and thou art God. It's pretty explicit, isn't it? There is no other one. There is no one else. There is no other thing. He's saying, I'm it. If you don't like it? Well, I'm sorry. I'm still it. Right? Uh, I would much rather like you just get over it and kind of move along. Right? God alone. So verses 1 through 10 of this psalm, y'all, have been dealing with looking up. God, you're wonderful. God, you're alone. God, you're powerful. God, you're everything that there is. God, please come, come listen to me. All of that, verses 1 through 10, has been dealing with that. And then the rest of it, verses 11 through 17, deals with us. Right? And everything that we're, we're supposed to learn. Looking inside at who we are. David says, teach me thy way, O Lord. I will walk in thy truth, unite my heart to fear thy name. Teach me thy way. Like I told you, I'm not, I don't remember a whole lot of prayers of asking God to teach me. I don't remember a whole lot of prayers of asking God, Lord, show me your mercy, show me your loving kindness, show me your grace, all this other stuff. I don't I live, I live over here in the, in, the, in, the, in, in the car, in the bills, and the house, and the kids, and everything else that goes on. And the stress that God wants to be in that, too. You know how he wants to be in the other. So, Lord. Hmm. 
Jesus said, John 14, 6, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. And so if I'm going to walk in the truth like Jesus is in the truth, it's the same thing here. The Bible works together. It's talked about it in the Psalms. It's talked about it in John, right? Walking in the truth. How am I going to do that? God has to show me. God has to teach me that. The, he's given me the book, right? And God has to do that work in me. It's the reason why this is a prayer. And David is saying, God, show me. God, teach me. God, lead me. Yes? I will praise thee, O Lord, my God, with all my heart, and I will glorify thy name for forever more. That's a whole other sermon in one verse. <laughs> Not going to do it, right? Glory! He gets the glory. Why? Because he made the world, everything that, that, that framed everything that there is, and then he chooses to have a relationship with these, these creations, me and you, who foul it up on a regular basis, and then loves us. He's glorious before that. On the cross, Jesus was glorified. Glorify thy son. You remember that? He gives. Verse 13, For great is thy mercy toward me, and thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell. Hell needs to be a second nature word for us, our families, and our kiddos. Because they hear the word hell, they hear the words like hell no, and they go, you know, things like that. They need to know the difference between when someone's saying that on the street or at the Walmart and what the difference is and why and how we feel about hell, don't they? That it is a big deal. So then when they hear it in the wrong way, they go, that's not really the right way to use that word. Because that word means something. That word has a judgment on it. That word is a place where I'm not going, but still I don't want anybody else to go there. It needs to be normal. It needs to not be this kind of shh, hush word. It's a real word. It's a real place. We'll talk about heaven all day long, Monday through Sunday, no problem. But then when, when hell, it's like weird. You, know, you bring up hell to the dinner table and you're like, what's the deal? I'm not going. You're not going. No. We just don't feel. We don't fit. Second, second nature word. Again, just like the Bible was talking about that how thou hast made, it's the same thing with you and me going along through life. Whenever we say yes, if someone doesn't know Christ, then yes, we're going to end up in hell. Just keep right on going along with it, right? Totally different uh, heart in verse 1 through 17 than that's in here. Did you get it? That's why I need songs. The Psalms is going to take and break and show and lead, and it's going to say, it's going to put the truth in there. It's going to change me the way it needs to be. It's going to give me boldness to depend upon God. All those things are in Psalms. Come a lot from the Psalms. Jesus quoted the Psalms all through the New Testament. All kinds of quotes leading back to the Psalms. O oh God, the crowd are risen against me, and the assemblies of the violent men have sought after my soul and have not set me before them. We have no idea what it's like to be persecuted. Here. We're not. We think persecuted is somebody taking the Ten Commandments down in a school. That's persecution. It's inconvenient, and it takes and it takes the truth out of somewhere where it should be. But persecution is somebody with a gun or a knife to your throat telling you to give up the Lord who you love or else. That's persecution. Persecution is having people come knock at your house, come into your house, take everything that you have and you own because you're a believer, because you're a Christian. There are people around the world that deal with real persecution. We do not. And a lot of modern day preaching uh, especially American preachers, they take this and they go, well, sometimes it works, you know, you're just persecuted. You can't really say everything or in the, or in the house, you know, you're just persecuted a little bit. No, you are not. No idea what persecuted really means. And so in the, in the, in the psalm that's on prayer, talking about persecution, David was persecuted. David knew what it was like to almost die. <coughs> Right? How does that work for us? Because we are not persecuted in this country. 
Well, it's double. It's double-edged sword. Because when we're persecuted, we ought to be the loudest, proudest, out there the most, busiest, telling everybody that needs to know. Because why? Because we're not going to get persecuted for it. And then two, we ought to be the most most biggest praying for people that are persecuted and, and that all that can be because we know what it's like to not be persecuted. I was reading an email this week of Corey uh, Ten Boom. How the, she had a house there in, in Europe during World War II and how the Nazis would come in and they would come in and take people out just for just for being Christians or, or for Jews. That's persecution. Do you understand? Our kiddos, our kiddos are growing up. They have no idea that that really does happen. And so they, they grow up like this with blinders on. And then they, they're really quick to actually deal with the fact that that does happen in the world. They need to go on mission trips. They need to see poverty. They need to see suffering. They need to see persecution. They need to know that it's just real. Right? Verse 14, pride, I'm not going to say anything else, just be careful, it's going to be all through the Psalms. If you're not careful, then your pride will make sure that you pay no more attention to the Psalms than you do anything else, and you'll go right on through them without being changed at all. That's just one word, that's just pride. Solution, get rid of it, kill it, move on. 16, O turn unto me and have mercy upon me, give thy strength unto thy servant and save the son of thine hand may show me a token for good that they which, they which hate me may see it and be ashamed because thou Lord has hoped in me and comforted me there's tons of words in there I'm going to read them to you uh, if you have a highlighter if you have a pen this would be a good idea for you to underline or pay attention uh, there's so many of these words power packed in these couple verses uh I don't want you to miss it because it's all in one spot. Very few parts of the Bible, there's so much in just a few verses that it's just all there together. Okay. Remember verse 11 through 17 deals with us and how we are. So you have teach in verse 11. You have unite uh, in verse 11 that's important. Uh, verse 12, there's uh, glorify. 13 is mercy and delivered. Uh, 14, you have proud. And verse 15, there it is, compassion, gracious, long-suffering, mercy, and truth. Uh, verse 16, you have mercy and strength. And verse 17, comforting. You almost have to read the whole entire Gospel of Matthew, or Luke, to get all that back to those really seven verses. If you need those again, I'll give them to you after. Right. Psalms. I had to go to God with this because the prayer life my prayer life. Let me, let me back up. When you hear a lesson, when you hear a, when you hear a sermon on prayer, there's one of two things that's going to happen. You're going to whip yourself to death and say, "I don't pray enough," and then you're going to try Monday and you're going to fail, and then you're going to be the same. Anybody ever done that? Yes, right. Or you're going to throw everything out with the bathwater about prayer. You start fresh. You look at this. See the dependence of God that David had, and you start working on your prayer life the way that it needs to be worked on, however God is dealing with you about it. Right? A good place to start, God, could you teach me about your <laughs> all these things that we just saw in those seven verses? Right? Praying together as a family, I'm horrible about praying. I would Jennifer like I need to every day. I work on it. It's a struggle for me, right? Because life is busy, life happens. Doesn't mean I'm off the hook. It's important for us to pray together. Whenever it says, hey, can you pray for me about this? Well, then stop praying and then do it. That's the worst thing in the world for you to say, yeah, I'll pray for you, and then you just forget. And that person goes on thinking that you prayed for them, and you no more open your mouth than anything else. Right? 
it's real. This is conversation. Prayer, uh, Billy Graham said, prayer, com prayer is just a conversation between you and God. So do not come away from this uh, with the whip. Because if you ever hear, hear my preaching, and, you, and the only thing you take from it is I'm not good enough, that I didn't do enough, there's an issue with it in the application because it's supposed to be a breaking of the heart, a breaking of the spirit, in which we turn to this and we say yes, and then we let God do his work. It's a whole lot better than a bow and chain and a whip. Amen? Let's pray and then we'll be finished this morning. We'll have a verse of invitation right after our prayer.